Great. Hello, everyone. It's good to see the full house. It's more, slightly more intimidating than I thought, <laughs> but good to have you here. So I'm Pavel Mania. I'm one of the deputy directors of Humanitarian Leadership Academy, the host of today's event. And if you might sign up to this session a long time before, you might not know what it's about. So let me remind you that uh, it's responding to response. We call it the session this way because we all know that local organizations are the first to respond and the last to leave. Today we want to discuss how to navigate those often conflicting needs of civil society organizations responding to crisis, planning for the future and responding uh, to the immediate, uh, uh, providing immediate rapid response. We see this happening in Eastern Europe where conflict in Ukraine forced many organizations to enter, un, either repeat their work or scale up their, uh, their operations quite dramatically. We are now approaching a very sad anniversary, second anniversary of the invasion of Ukraine. So we try to address some quite difficult questions here. If and how Eastern European response was different to any other, and have, have we used this unique opportunity and unprecedented funding that we had in, the, in Ukraine and, and neighboring countries, to respond differently. So we have great people and a great panel to address those challenging questions. Let me introduce you, to, uh, make some introductions first. Rachel Bryan, the Director of Humanitarian Leadership Academy, the host of today's event, a qualified humanitarian coach. We had a session of coaching just before this. Rachel has supported the incubation of other organizations supporting localization efforts, including ELRA and Start Network, another of our founding partners, not to mention our own Humanitarian Leadership Academy. Madara Hatairachi, Director of Programs, Accounta uh, Programs and Accountability at disaster of the Disaster Emergency Committee, an umbrella body that brings together 50 largest humanitarian organizations in the UK. Madara brings 24 years of experience across a number of agencies and was a rapid responder in 13 large scale emergencies across the globe. Miroslava Kerek, the President of Fundacja Ukraiński Dom, Ukrainian House, the biggest Ukrainian led organization in Eastern Europe, she brings together 20 years of experience in civic, civic activity towards the integration of migrants and refugees with a huge scale up of operations after February 2022. So the, so the recent invasion. Mirka or Miroslava has also made a list of Forbes 24 women to watch in 2024. So that's huge, huge congrats. That's the most recent news. And finally, yes. Anastasia Korupchuk, HLA's learning, uh, learning specialist based in Kiev, Ukraine, uh, working with Save the Children Ukraine, our key partner. And I know you have made huge effort to come here. It took you 24 hours to make this session directly from Kiev. So huge appreciation for, for that. So starting with two questions for Rachel and Madara, maybe to, to you both. How can the humanitarian sector effectively balance the immediate relief needs in crisis situations with the long-term goals of strengthening local organizations? I can kick off. Um, I think it really depends on the context and really looking at each particular context, each response context, um, who are the key players and building on, on top of that. Um, I think in previous years, people might have thought it's such a large rapid scale up in places like Ukraine or Turkey, Syria, that we don't really have the time to do capacity strengthening or exchange. We'll, we'll do that sort of month three, month, month six down, down the line. But I think we really see agencies, um, grassroots entities, like we've seen in Ukraine, Romania, Poland, really um, scale up. And what they, what they need is that extra bit of support, whether it's meaningful quality funding, um, linking them to the international humanitarian architecture um, or, you know, um, that support around linking into international technical and humanitarian standards. So really, I think from day one, as soon as we launch a response, you can start thinking about how do we um, do that immediate kind of quick wins of supporting local entities with their capacity exchange. There's a lot we, we can learn from local entities. So how do you, from day one, set the roadmap for immediate, medium, and long-term capacity strengthening and, and thinking of it in the ways of funding, the networking, uh, linking it up to the humanitarian architecture and, and standards and principles from there. Thank you, Madara. Rachel, what's your take on that? It's always easier going second because yeah. uh, <laughs> can just build. And I, I totally agree. And I think that meaningful kind of humanitarian funding is absolutely critical. And the 
for me, it's the and, and, so it's not an either or. We're not doing immediate response and not thinking about the next bit, but it's how do we connect it all together? So we, we look at, obviously, immediate life-saving response is absolutely important, but at the same time, also be looking to that longer term, which I think is where the engine two piece that we've been considering really comes in, so that right from the very beginning, as well as doing this, we are also thinking about that longer term, which is absolutely how do we interconnect that much more effectively and we, we have to do that by trialing new things. We have to have different ways of thinking and different approaches. And that's the most important thing, that it's about trialing those different things, see what does work. And I think this is where the uniqueness of what we're trialing out in Poland and Ukraine is coming in, so that we've really got that ability to, to see what works. And if it doesn't, then, then amend it. But I think we have to get away from that, that normal way of doing things and just really think about what does come next. So your question about that strengthening local organisations, that long-term goal has to be the immediate goal as well as that long-term goal so that we're connecting, connecting it together. Um, yeah, I think. <coughs> And we have, because of like, we're actually representing so different agencies, right? And working together from the, the donor, the, you know, the supporting local organizations and to representatives from local organizations as well. So, and you mentioned like, we're talking about how important is working together. So in terms of collaborations, how do you think like donors and responding NGOs and local partners can collaborate to address the systemic needs and support non-standard emerging humanitarian actors that we have plenty of in Eastern Europe, ensuring a more inclusive and diverse ecosystem, and we talked about ecosystems in the previous panel. I think firstly, asking the local responders mm. who's got boots on the ground, what do you need? What, 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 what is the support that you need? I think we, you know, sometimes that kind of um, launch a response and think we might know what the capacity gaps are because we you know, use the blueprint from another response, but really asking the local entities, they know the local cult context, culture, dynamics, um, and building from that. So with Ukraine, um, we commissioned a localization scoping study to really hear from the first responders, what do you, what do you consider um, um, support um, that you require to ensure it's a locally led, robust, locally led response. And based on that, we put in measures like pulled funding. Uh, we're collaborating with Start Network, save HLA to um, uh, pull a pooled funding together for local entities. So it, it's that of looking, asking the local responders, what do you need? And then working alongside and bringing others to the table, uh, making sure that you know, funders, um, INGOs, local NGOs, and uh, respective governments understand kind of what that roadmap looks like so everyone can be joined up in that. Some, sounds idealistic, mm. but mm. as Rachel talked about, you got to try it, right? You got you got to try things and see if it works, and and keep building on top of that. And I think the the only, the only build for me, if I can just just add, is that it's how we are all humanitarians, and it's how do we go out of that non traditional again? So making sure that we have those networks and 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 really use all of those networks around us, um, because we don't necessarily always use them as effectively as we could. So. Just like today, we've got different, you know, you wouldn't necessarily imagine we have public, private sector, how we use those networks across rather than just your normal, um, traditional, which I've spoken to before, humanitarian networks, so that we really are collaborating all together to get that kind of everyone solution rather than just um, that immediate solution. Thank you, Rachel. As Madara said, like, yes, we have to ask lo local responders. So, Mirka, question to you. You obviously, we are lucky to have you here. I mean, you could also please tell us more about your organization uh, because we would like to learn more about the Ukrainian House. But how is your organization balancing those efforts, responding to today and planning for, to, for the future? And what are the most pressing concerns for you and your organization uh, at the moment, <laughs> two years into the conflict? <laughs> First of all, I would like to thank you all. Uh, as a Ukrainian, I really appreciate, and also in the name of my team, who are majority refugees or migrants, and also people whom we help, that we are really thankful for your support. And it's really important these two years to have you on together with us and to support us. And I think this is very much appreciated and really uh, even yesterday, we visited some Ukrainian center here, and people were saying how they are ha how they are thankful to Great Britain, for instance, for helping them, for accommodating Ukrainians here. So it's it's the case as well in Poland and many countries. And this is it's very important for us to underline it because this is 
it's, uh, it means a lot for us, and it also not only a kind of humanitarian first crisis support, but also it's a kind of investment in the resilience, in the people's ability to function, to regain their own life, and to function, to build something again, new life again. So this is very important to keep doing it. So that's, that's for us also... It connects how we, how we as an organization functions. For us, it is very important to, to make a holistic support. So it's uh, till 24th of February 22, we were not humanitarian organization. We were a local Ukrainian migrant NGO that had more than 10 people. And, but we had many projects, so we had more than 10 years of experiences. But still, it's not the humanitarian response. And it's one day you had to transform and to have to learn to navigate also in this uh, ocean of the international organization as well and also how to scale up and it was a huge challenge for us and also some people from business said well business scales up but not in such a speed as you did so in a few days you have become 150 mm -hmm. and you need to manage to organize this organization the, the team so it's still as a challenge for majority of our organization how to make it function smoothly how to provide also budget for that because this is also before then we had small team and budget was much smaller so now it's a not only it's a huge big, bigger budget and needs are bigger so that's that's it's the challenge but in terms of holistic support this is we what we do we have support center where you have you can come you have consultation from all the topics you can have if you come to to the other country we also have info line we provide job counseling accommodation we manage to accommodate around 14,000 people and 2,000 pets, I think. So this is, was also important for people for, to accommodate. And uh, so we also provide language courses, cultural events. And this what is also for us as a... As I, what you said, with the grassroots organization, know how to help. The people, for instance, I usually use the case of our library. People were coming asking for food accommodation, and they were saying, you know, we didn't manage to take the books with us. And we have kids, children. We, could, you, could you find, could you borrow books? So we established a library as an emergency, because people needed also books. So it's a, I know that it's different context, is different, but it's very important to listen to our, this type of organization as ours, because then you would probably not guess that library is one of the important um, uh, important um, activity, and we have more than 600 regular uh, readers now. So it's it's uh, it's very important. So for uh, for so that's why we kind of we established the complex of of uh, services which were needed even before 20, uh, 2022. And nowadays we are ready for those who are in crisis. So we are still have new new arrivals because the war is going on. We have. Each day we have shellings and also people uh, deciding to flee or those who return to Ukraine now again decide to go back because it's not safe. So, but we also have those who live already for two years. And for them, it's even much difficult because the support uh, is diminishing. Many of your NGOs, as well as you know, you are like uh, council. I mean, you don't have resources, for instance, to stay in Poland. And you, you go out of, of Poland and the people need help. And for instance, these are the most vulnerable. We have elderly people, people with disabilities, um, mothers generally with multiple kids. For them, it's really critical. And if, if the organization is going out, the funding is going out, they don't have a support. So the problems even it's much more complicated than it was even in the beginning. So, um, so that's why we have kind of the system to support those new arrivals and those who, um, who, who are in Poland. And it's a challenge for us, a five organization, for many of us. It's, of course, funding. And this is uh, to secure it because we also hope, of course, the state step in and to have provide support. But so far, it's, of course, it's a... Uh, also political issue, it's, you know, the longer we are abroad, the longer we are in the countries where, we, where Ukrainians fled, it becomes political, it becomes sometimes scapegoat of political games. And nowadays in Poland we have a grain scandal and it's also, it um, can affect also Ukrainians who live there. Unfortunately, this is, we cannot... Uh, be safe in a way. Also, in this time that we have, uh, that it's it's then it's become even much more difficult for us to help than it was two years ago when everyone was really ready and was not. Um, there was a kind of understanding that it's very important to help. 
Thank you. And you said, what's important, you said as well, that it seems like a lot of organizations are exiting Eastern yes. Europe, the neighboring countries. But with, let's talk about Ukraine, Anastasia, a little bit. Obviously, you, in your role, you're supporting a number of local organizations, work with a number of partners. If you can tell us more about the regional center you work for and sort of what in your capacity, and also if you can, in the, in the context of Ukraine, what is the specific challenges that you see of local, the local organizations face in the efforts to respond and, and what has been done to address them? Well, thank you for inviting me. It was a last minute long travel, but I'm happy to be here uh, finally. Um, so I think the first challenge was the lack of preparedness that we had. Uh, Though we had been having the war and humanitarian crisis for eight years, but unfortunately, the experience of organizations responded to it locally was not properly documented and adjusted. And like by the civil society and at the state level, and it may seem naive now, but this is the retrospective view. In reality, no one really expected for such a large humanitarian crisis to happen. Um, I know that now the attitude to preparedness is changing, and I know this question is raised more often, and it was the right time for it today, actually, to step in with its mission. Um, so at the beginning of the large-scale invasion, we had quite a capable civil society and with, with little experience. And then we had NGOs, we had UN agencies. The aid system was activated, and to act quickly, of course, the system um, uses like the mechanisms that are already in place, the funding mechanisms, the programming. Um, but I believe that it could be a bit more efficient if the voices of local organizations were heard. Uh, of, like It could be uh, less duplication, it could be more complementary work. Of course, it is the question of trust, which cannot be built in a second, but at the end of the day, with all the movement restrictions for NGO employees and sometimes lack of contextual knowledge, you, if you still want to help, you have to trust someone who is already there and who's physically there. Um, so that's basically the second, <laughs> the second point I was trying to make, the coordination issues. And the other point is that the capacity building and support provided by donor organizations to their local and national partners is usually very closely tied to the specific donor requirements and the frameworks that the organization developed. And uh, it cannot cover all the needs of the partners. It aims to improve the partnership and to make the partnership experience <laughs> more convenient uh, and benefit the certain partnership or project, not partners. Um, and having this opportunity as HLA under SHIFT uh, project, previously known as Engine 2, to focus like, solely on the needs of local organizations is a privilege that we have. Um, and I believe it can have a long-term positive impact in the region, but also finally to somehow bring relief to the international humanitarian system. Because as many other people in this room, I believe we will have more conflicts and more crises. And... Um... <laughs> oh, th thank you. And I think what you mentioned is trust, right? That's very important. And I think uh, we very appreciate the trust that DC had in us, in, in, our, in our partners as well, to work differently. So Matara, like, just you know, talking about Ukraine, we knew there's a precedent at funding and there's an opportunity for us and for the DC to work differently. And if you can tell us more about sort of the, what was the motivation of, of your organization to, to work differently, to ch champion different ideas and talk about sort of what, the inno what innovation you're seeing already from, from the members that you're working with. Yeah, I think the motivation, um, as soon as um, we were launching the Ukraine humanitarian appeal, we sensed the public generosity was that is, was going to be once in a generational type of response. Um, we worked with ALNAP on some lessons learned on pre previous European um, responses, looked at the tsunami evaluation of Asia Tsunami um, 2004 to really understand what lessons were there that we could um, ap apply here. And in the tsunami evaluation um, of Asia, um, that report talked about agencies reduced suffering, alleviated suffering, but didn't really reach the potential of the collective impact. And that really 
hit hit my heart, it hit my soul of we can't do the same thing again, where you know a, a huge, uh, a well resourced, really horrific conditions on the ground, but a well resourced response. We can't do what we always do, uh, kind of get into business as usual. That we really need to step aside and think: How do we, while agencies are delivering basic, um, immediate services? How do we look at that collective impact, really looking at furthering some of the non-negotiables, localization, accountability to affected populations, safeguarding, cash? There's an opportunity for us with the, the, the resources to really put our health heads together to try and move the needle a little bit, really accelerate it. Um, part of it is field facing and, and really looking at Ukraine, Romania, Poland, Moldova, and Hungary, but also in the UK. It was an opportunity because Ukraine's right on our doorstep, really looking at how do we talk about cash in a humanitarian response with the UK public, so make sure that they're going on the journey with us. So when we do a response in Somalia or Gaza or Afghanistan, they understand what cash looks like. They understand what localization, that trusting the local entities look like in some of these other, other contexts. So it was, it's that of really addressing the Ukraine humanitarian crisis in the neighboring um, countries and, and using investing in innovation, um, trusting the agencies and looking at new partnerships, new ways of working, but also kind of having that long-term view of let's, let's use this opportunity to see how we could set things up in, in other places like Turkey, Syria. And on the heels of Ukraine, we did similar. Um, we, we've done uh, further investment in localization, accountability, safeguarding in Turkey, Syria. So l using the lessons of Ukraine and, and carrying that through. Thank you. And I think you also mentioned also the how important is the learning from each response that we deliver. And yes. you're doing this great work with ARNAP. But Rachel, as well, we, HLA is a global organization, right? You, we're using also this Ukraine crisis to learn and to pilot different initiatives. But we definitely want to look much more globally. So could you tell us more about how you envision scaling up some of the operations? And given the unique opportunities that we have with Ukraine cri crisis, what's the plan of integrating those lessons learned into, into wider global work for your organization? Um, I mean, I think the honest answer is we don't entirely know yet, um, but we do need to learn. We need to fail fast and, and figure out the things that don't work and then, and then move on and do other things, um, but then learn quickly. So the importance of doing in the moment research, not necessarily that long drawn out longitudinal stuff, which is important, but also how do we learn in the moment? How do we capture that evidence? and then make sure that we can take what is working and then translate it elsewhere. So what does that look like contextually in a different response, in a different context? Um, and make sure that that is, is really done. And I think the other bit we've, we've touched on already with the examples that have been happening is that um, I think part of what we're talking about here is that we're, we're trying to do a very... We're looking at a very different way of operating in the future. So what do those partnerships look like so that we are connecting both the immediate piece with that longer term piece and really look fr from the get-go about the purposeful longer term partnerships so that when something happens we actually already have that ecosystem in place and I think that's part of what we've learned from from Ukraine is you know partnerships may end after the short-term funding but what we've been learning through this is, is to build much longer term partnerships and we've had so many examples just of today about what those networks look like and I think trying to put that into practice as well so use this as a real um, learning experience for what we can do differently elsewhere. Thank you and I mean, Ukrainian Heights is a great example because you know you, you sort of work with Save the Children, you work with HLA, participate in different programs, the initiatives, the longer term, short term initiatives. So what, Mirka, what are your lessons learned and sort of what is the message you have for donors like DC or NGOs like Save the Children Humanitarian Leadership Academy in terms of this approach? What we should continue doing or what we should stop doing as well? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I would just uh, maybe add a light tra distrust because I, I want also to say that it's important to trust in the local organization or like the diaspora organization or refugee because we definitely know how to function. We, we, are we have trust from people whom we help. And also I, I think this was a good example of response when also many international organizations, including Save the Children and Deb, who is sitting there, trusted in us and supported because we managed to establish Ukrainian school in three weeks. And with 
support of uh, Save the Children. So it was amazing. We knew that it's needed, and you've trusted that you will, uh, that it's also needed. So that also shows that sometimes, of course, there are problems in, with the other with the organization, but generally it's it's important to to have this trust. In terms of our lesson roles, of course, it's a, it's a, it was a challenge, of course, with the processes, due diligence, with the bureaucracy which are international organizations have, and we didn't have, we didn't need it to have because we were smaller, we had a smaller, we had our usual routes of getting grants from the European Union or from somewhere else, but still it was a new for us, but sometimes I think it's important to reduce the bureaucracy uh, in different uh, parts of the world because then also, in other case, we have Polish bureaucracy, in Ukraine, probably Ukrainian bureaucracy, and also we are much more controlled by the also state authorities, and I think in other con countries it's also probably like this. Of course, there are some countries where the state, the state is not existing, but still the organization could use, you, will, you could use the benefit of having this initiative activists, organizations there to, to, to provide the support. So that's, I think, the, the bureaucracy should be a bit limited or standardized. So if you do it once, you don't have to do it a few times, the due diligence, for instance, or many others. And what is also important, I think, for us, it's uh, also this um, immediate crisis support, support, but also thinking about the integration and it's in, like make it more longer. Because as I see now, it's not only important to provide these basic needs, but if we give the, the people like some stability, some like investing in the uh, um, reskilling or upskilling on the labor market, they will be more active. They will be they will feel much confident and they will regain their life and better. And then. Maybe they will stay in the host country, or maybe they will return. For instance, in case of Ukraine, but they will use the competencies. So it's not it's not wasted money if you invest in that. It's made, it's invested money, and it's very much appreciated then. And uh, this experience gained being abroad, it's it's pays back later on. Also, in terms of uh, social cohesion in countries, the people are, or if uh, if they return to Ukraine, I think this is very important to make it more holistic and plus long longer term also including this inclusion and integrational programs. And uh, so our experiences, what we do now, it's uh, two years of war, so it's still war is going on. We don't know when it will end. So that's why we still need the support till the end of the war. And that's that's a challenge. And I know for your, for the big organization, international organization, it's a challenge to have long conflicts and how to work with them. But uh, I think it's maybe need to re reshape the programs and to include this phase of uh, integration and uh, pro support of refugees for a longer period. Thank you, Mika and Anastasia. Like, big responsibility representing yeah. <laughs> all agencies, like local organizations in Ukraine, obviously huge burden. And also realizing we only have two minutes, but what is your message using this audience that we have, right, and the, the, the partner that we have, and also given the anniversary that we're approaching in four days, two years into the war, what is your fi like final statement? What is that you would ask to know about the situation of for local organization or responders, but also what's your final sort of closing statement here? Yeah, this is really difficult to speak on behalf of all organizations. <laughs> the responsibility is, is too big, but the point I would like to make is that um, the Ukrainian organizations and Ukrainian humanitarians are forced humanitarians. It was not their choice to do the job. Uh, they had to do it, and but now they take the role seriously. They take seriously the questions of accountability, the questions of transparency, uh, apply and do no harm. They want to be a good humanitarians, and I would like to use this chance within the Shift Project not to not only make them better humanitarians, but to make them more mature organizations in general. Uh, so that they will be able to have more sustainable donor outreach and diversify the funding sources to someday do something different, <laughs> to shift to development again, to do a different kind of projects. Like Because I wrote the, the proposals for research and culture and media before the war, now I'm doing a completely different job. So yeah, that is my hope and my message today. Thank you so much. And I realize we only have 30 seconds left. So thank you very much, everyone, for participating. Like, a special thanks to, to you, Anastasia and you, Mirka, for like, making the trip, because mm -hmm. it's, it's so valuable to hear from local organizations and firsthand 
on sort of what we can do to support you better. So thank you, everyone. Rachel Madara, mm -hmm. Mirka Anastasia, thanks so much. And thank you for your thank you. thank you very much.